Hello, everyone. And um, hello, Dr. James Hollis. Thank you very much for accepting to have this interview with us. We are going to discuss today about a um, very recent book that um, is uh, now on the shelves. Um, it's called, uh, uh, and I'm going to say this in Romanian, Cautara Sensului, Chemara Sinelui, și Redefinirea Centrului Interior. It's the latest book uh, translated uh, in Romanian. Uh, and we would like to discuss uh, on uh, uh, some uh, topics of this book uh, with you uh, today. Uh, first, thank you very much for accepting uh, this uh, interview with us. Well, I'm happy to be with you. And please feel free to call me Jim. That's what my friends call me. Thank you very much, Jim, then. Okay, uh, the book is uh, full of um, lessons, uh, meanings. Uh, it's a very rich book. Uh, and of course, we cannot uh, have all the questions addressed to you, but still, uh, I have just a few uh, lines of discussions. And if you uh, may wish to say some few words about uh, these questions that uh, everyone could have on their minds, uh, related to searching of the meaning. Um, first, I would like to start by asking you, uh, even if it's like a general question, maybe you can say something about the fundamental questions uh, that uh, one should ask themselves to understand the meaning of the life. Well, you know, Carl Jung said once, life is a short pause between two great mysteries. And that's a pretty good definition of this mystery that we all experience together. And uh, we all, I think, have the obligation to ask for ourselves. And what is this pause about? What am I to do here? Who am I? How am I to express myself in this world? What, I meant, what am I meant to serve? If we don't ask that last question, what am I meant to serve? Then we'll be serving our unconsciousness or we'll be serving whatever uh, is the loudest voice in our environment. So... All of us, I think, are tasked with the uh, questions of how am I to live my life, especially when we have to face circumstances over which we may have no outer control. How am I to respond? What am I to bring to this, uh, this encounter? So I, I think one of the central tasks or, or uh, premises of the modern world is that the task of meaning has shifted, so to speak, from the tribe, from sacred institutions, to the shoulders of the individual. And that's a great privilege, a great responsibility. To some, it's a great burden. And to uh, recognize there's a profound dignity and a summons of accountability for each of us. How shall I spend my life in service to what values? And I've often said to individuals, it's not so much what you do, it's what it's in service to inside of you. Is this coming from some natural and, and sort of profound aspect of your own humanity that's seeking expression here, or are you simply responding to whatever the pressures are at the moment? And of course, when we're tiny and vulnerable and dependent, we often have to necessarily trade away that inner voice. But the truth is we all have one, and we need to be able to recover a, a conversation with that inner voice in our subsequent years. You just said some uh, of the possible uh, uh, ways or techniques or means through which we can uh, search our uh, inner meaning, so to say. Uh, but and and in the book, actually, you you are pointing how important uh, pers the the personal myth are, how important mm -hmm. the uh, personal stories are. Um, and uh, the fact that those are uh, playing a crucial role in defining uh, our uh, meaning in life. Uh, how can we apply actually this understanding of the myths to, um, you know, uh, maybe rewrite our internal narratives if they mm -hmm. are, you know, mm -hmm. not the best ones? Uh, and uh, I'm asking uh, not in a uh, let's say, magical way, but in a more practical, as uh, all of us, uh, the ones that uh, uh, read until now your uh, um, works, uh, know that you are a very, very practical Jungian analyst. Well, I think um, none of us would turn our driving of our automobile over to an eight-year-old. 
or to a five-year-old. We would say, you're not old enough to steer this precious vehicle that's potentially dangerous as well. But psychologically, we do that all the time because, again, we learn the world's powerful, I'm not, and therefore I have to make my adaptations. We also, and you use a good word there, we story the world. I'll make that word story into a verb. We, we try to make sense of it. We try to find a narrative that helps us understand our place, what we are allowed to do, what we can't do, etc. But we get caught in the stories that we've constructed as children. Is the other person safe? Can I approach them with my legitimate self? Or do I have to hide who I am? Or do I have to in some way comply with what their demands are? Those kinds of very profound decisions are being made from childhood on. And they tend to get fixated within our intrapsychic systems um, in such a fashion that we become prisoners of those narratives. That's the equivalent of letting the eight-year-old uh, make a decision. Why did you choose that person to have a relationship with? What, why that career? What are these behavioral patterns that you have in your life that you find are hurtful to you or perhaps to others? Those are only questions we tend to ask later in life when we've run into some conflict. If the world says this is who you are, this is how you fit in with your family of origin after your culture or whatever your religious or educational uh, values may have been, that if, if they don't accord with something that is vital, alive, and seeking its expression in this world, then there's going to be a, a collision inside, an intrapsychic conflict. That's what tends to bring people into uh, therapy, for example. I'm not saying everybody needs to be in therapy. I'm simply saying as a therapist, I see all the time that there's been a, a, a collision between, like two automobiles running into each other, between what my stories tell me to do and what maybe what the world is asking of me and and what is seeking its own expression through me. Now, I want to hasten to add that this concern for the inner voice is not narcissism. It's not self-indulgence. If I'm living in a false relationship with myself, how can I not falsify my relationship with you or with others? So uh, until I have in some way addressed what are the drivers in my own life? What are the stories that perhaps I've outgrown? What are the summonses I have to grow up, be accountable for my choices, live my journey? And those, those are questions that if they're not asked in a very direct way, will tend to pathologize and produce what we call symptoms. And it's usually our symptoms that bring people into uh, medical treatment or to uh, psychological therapy. So um, what this is about is making us a, a bit more accountable for the stories that are working within each of us. I've often said to individuals, it's not so much what you think, do, or believe, or how you act, it's what it's in service in, to you inside that makes a big difference. Upon examination, we might recognize that that behavior was an old codependence of mine, an old adaptive mechanism, which may have been necessary for the child, but as an adult falsifies my relationships. Or, or, or maybe there was a shadow agenda there. That is to say, maybe that was coming from a place I'd rather not look at, my selfishness or, or my greed or my power issues or something of that sort. This kind of examination doesn't make you feel great. <laughs> it makes you feel humble because then you have to say, all right, here's something else I didn't understand about myself. So if we just simply close our eyes to that kind of internal conversation, then again, it keeps spilling into the world through us. Jung said once the greatest burden a child must bear is the unlived life of the, of the parent. You know, what I don't face what I don't address, namely where, where my you know, op opportunities are blocked by anxiety, let's say, or old lack of permission. Those are the places that I communicate to my children or to my partner or to my clients even. So in, in doing this work, we, we're not being selfish, as I said, or isolated. We are actually doing the work necessary to improve our outer relationships as well.
um, since you are uh, talking about the parents, the unlived life of the parents and so on and so forth, uh, I really would like to discuss with you a, a matter that uh, will link to the next question, but uh, for this one, uh, how do you, we make peace between or, uh, you know, um, make a balance between our urge to become our own uh, individual, our own, uh, you know, um, persons, um, identity and so on and so forth, uh, and still respect um, uh, our parents or, you know, uh, be proud with them, with the lessons learned from them. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, it's like not to serve them indefinitely, but still to uh, to guard somehow to to preserve uh, their memory and in, inside of us. So how do we make this balance? Mm -hmm. Of course. Well, uh, the kind of conversation you and I are having right now was not available. My parents, for example. My parents were young people at the beginning of the last century and were governed by economic factors. My, my father was pulled out of primary school and sent to work in the factory all of his life. My mother was uh, a secretary and a homemaker and neither of them had uh, an opportunity to address these kinds of questions. Their lives were governed by uh, social expectations, uh, role definitions and by economic hardship. And I'm fortunate that I was able at some level to find my own path out of that world. I honor them every day. I think of the privileges I've been able to have, um, but also the responsibility I've been able to have. Uh, the most important thing my parents ever said to me, other than expressing their love for me, which was genuine, was what will people think? Their life was governed by social expectations. And anytime I would step out of line or they would, they, they felt they were going to be punished harshly. And that's that's not a supportive culture. That's that's an imprisoning culture. And, and we live in psychological prisons all the time. And somewhere uh, we have to find, you know, the way in which uh, our life is expressing itself, again, not just in self-service in the sense of narcissism, but serving the self, which is <laughs> that, that larger um, source of purpose and meaning. Because in some way, the question of the first half of life is what is the world wanting of me? How do I mobilize enough ego strength to be able to enter the world, to uh, find a position at work and, and show up regularly and do the job I was hired for, uh, meet the other person halfway in relationships and, and so forth. Um, th those are important questions. We need to develop that strength and we need to develop that presence in the real world. We can't sit home and just reflect upon it. We have to enter the world and engage it. But having done that, then we have to ask, and now, again, why am I here in service to what? And a different question emerges. What is wishing expression through me and enters this world through me? See, now, again, that's about service. That's not about feeling great about myself. Quick example. As a child, my only fantasy about being an adult would be to have been a professional athlete, as many children would so dream. But I could never have imagined I would spend my days listening to people's heartaches, to their suffering, to be present to the uh, conflicts that they are uh, experiencing at the moment. And I don't find that makes me happy, but it gives me a profound sense of meaning and purpose to be able to share someone else's life, to work through the details of their particular stories and see which aspects of those stories are protective for them, which ones are developmental for them, and which ones are blocking them, which ones are stopping them. So even to this day, uh, I, as other people, have those ancestral voices in my head, and I need to be able to distinguish them from the voices that are also calling me from my own depths that are seeking in its own way expression in the world. As a child, I couldn't imagine that I would become a therapist. I never knew that such a thing existed. I don't even know if my parents did, except for psychiatrists in a movie or something like that. So mm -hmm. uh, and this is about recognizing, as you pointed out, the end of the 19th century, he said, you know, meaning was once defined by family, once defined by one's tribe, defined by one's 
religious orientation. And those could serve positive values, but many times they were in conflict with the terrain of the inner life of the individual, the, the soul. And when I use the word soul, it's the literal translation of the Greek word psyche. Mm -hmm. We are psychological beings, which is to say we are beings that are, you know, <laughs> carrying some sort of energy that is seeking expression in the world. That's not about making me have a comfortable life. <laughs> it's not about me having a, a, a life that is, uh, you know, uh, affluent particularly. You know, if the goal is to make money in life or gain power or something, well, we see people around us who have done those things and we have to ask ourselves, would I really want the life of that person? Would I, would I want in some way to experience the hardships and the suffering that they also go through? So I think in, in each of us, there's a summons to personal accountability. There's a summons to uh, grow up, to become responsible. There's a summons to serve something that is really purposeful for you. And how do you define that purposefulness? Well, I mean, it's purposeful to, to support your family, for example. So that makes me necessarily an economic being of some kind. But if my whole life is defined that way, that's too narrow an avenue for the breadth and amplitude of the soul's uh, expect expectations of us. So we, we have to then keep asking the question, you know, why am I here in service to what? And, and, and what talents or interests or enthusiasms or curiosities are, are pushing at me and, and, and wishing to be honored? Uh, as children, we were close to that. It was the world of our instinct and it was the world of our imagination. But then the structures of the world, family and schooling and popular culture, et cetera, all began their imposition upon us. Now, we, we need to be socialized as children. I'm not suggesting that we shouldn't be. We need to learn to stop at the stop sign so we don't harm somebody else when we drive our automobile. But at the same time, we recognize with every trade-off there's a possible cost in, inside of us that is costly to the soul. So it's the accumulation of those compromises we make with our own souls that brings people into therapy or causes their suffering or produces self-medication or whatever it is that shows up as their particular form of pathology. So from an analytic standpoint, we don't say, well, how quickly do I remove the pathology? We, we rather ask the question, <clears throat> Why has it come? What is it asking of us? What correctives do I need to make in my own life? And as reductive as it may sound, uh, most of our behaviors, most of our, our uh, patterns in life are fear-based at some original point in our life. And that's not to judge it, it's simply to understand that that might have been necessary, but today my fear-based responses, where I you know, avoid taking on some project or encountering some value conflict, uh, or, or where I wind up complying with the pressures of the hour, or where I'm caught in secret power complexes trying to dominate others, those, those are those moments of encounter with our own psychological history which when they go unaddressed, when they remain unconscious, keep spilling into the world through the patterns I make and through the relational difficulties that I've uh, assembled here. Well, um, this is a very comprehensive answer. And uh, actually uh, uh, hearing you, I was, uh, you know, I had uh, a lot of questions popping in my head, but one, uh, uh, it really imposes, and uh, this is um, the religious part that you are mentioning. Um, uh, and also the fact that in your book, there is a chapter dedicated to the psychological view over those, uh, the, the, let's say, capital seven sins. Mm -hmm. For me, it was very surprising and uh, extremely uh, well received. Uh, can you say something about what um, determined you to enter such a uh, chapter? Well, it actually arose out of a, of a uh, topic that was assigned to me once when I was living in Houston, Texas. So it wasn't originally my idea to address that. But, but I wanted to ask the question, uh, how did our ancestors see our behavioral patterns? And of course, one of the systems that we've all inherited in the Western world 
is an encounter with what were called the seven deadly sins. And they were observations of human behavior. And the fact that those behaviors common to all of us over time often produce negative consequences. So um, as I looked at the seven deadly sins, I found that four or five of them all came out of a deficit sense of, of self. In other words, an, an inability to recognize my own inherent value and own inherent worth um, often led to overcompensation <clears throat> in the outer world, such as greed, for example. Greed for what? What is it you want more of? We, we're familiar with the famous story of King Midas, for example. And, and uh, he wanted gold and wealth. So the gods heard that and said, well, you want gold? Here it is. Everything turns to gold. And he realized that when you receive what you were looking for, you'll find it often is not nourishing, is not life-sustaining, and so forth. So it was a chapter saying, if we looked at each of those seven deadly sins in the lens of modern psychology, we're still looking at the same terrain, you know, the human psyche and its interaction with the world. Uh, how would we look at that today? And what is there of value in the concept? Now, the seven deadly sins were, of course, arising out of you know, authoritarian systems, which are saying, all right, here's, here's what the wise elders say is what you should do with your life. Here's what you can do, what you can't do, et cetera. But is there wisdom that lies beneath the, the authoritarian element there, you see? Now, the word sin uh, originally came from a Greek term that was actually an archery term. It didn't mean a person was bad. It meant that a person was like an archer who can't hit the target all the time. So it was built into our human limitations. And what sounds so judgmental is, is also a, a, an existential limitation that each one of us has. So none of us, for example, can be wise enough, kind enough, uh, sympathetic enough to be able to make the right decisions all the time. So it's not about judging, it's about understanding how much of your life is on automatic pilot, so to speak, how much is reflexive in response. I often think that 90% of our <clears throat> responses in any given day are mostly stimulus response, stimulus response, and some of that's helpful. So you, you start to cross the street, you look both directions, be sure an automobile is not coming. That's, that's a healthy uh, reflex. <clears throat> But many of our responses to life are reflexive in character and not truly thought out or not truly conscious. And you can say, well, I don't have time to reflect upon these matters. Well, right, you don't at the moment, but if you don't over time reflect on that, then you're going to be a creature of those stories, of those conditioning forces, of, of those intrapsychic factors that are not necessarily your friend. They're all about protecting you and integrating you into the world that you're involved in. That's understandable, and that's not a bad motive. On the other hand, it's again from another time, another place, and is not conscious. So mm -hmm. again, would you drive unconsciously? We have laws against drug driving with reckless driving, all right? Well, why? Because if I'm not consciously uh, making decisions in my life, what parts of me are making those decisions? And simply to recognize that there are intrapsychic parts in us that are at work constantly. Many of them, they are part of our exposure to a particular family of origin, to a particular cultural point of view. And in doing so, we may fit into that environment at that moment. But what happens when that is in conflict with something inherent in one's own nature? Just to choose a kind of obvious example, let's say a person, a child is born with an artistic talent, but is in a time and place and family, let's say, that has zero appreciation or zero capacity for understanding what, say, making music is about or art or whatever. Um, that child may or may not break out of that in time, but in either case, they're going to experience an enormous amount of suffering. <clears throat> So you know, the purpose of a, of a family, I think, in addition to supplying, you know, shelter and food and affection and affirmation, is to be a platform to launch the, the growth and development of, of each child, to support their development in this world. Mm -hmm. So I, I think there would be a, a revolution in the world if, if every parent could overcome their own fears and their own narcissistic impulses and say to the child, 
always be mindful of your choices and their impact on others. We're not fostering self-absorption or narcissism here, but you're here to live your life, your journey. You're not here to please me. I'm living my life in a way that makes sense to me. I want you to live your life and you will always be loved and supported in that process by me, but you're here to live that journey. Now, I never heard that speech. I don't imagine many people in our audience have heard that speech. Not even uh, in your children? Sorry? Not even with your children? You never heard the speech? I don't. Well, who makes babies? Young people. I, I don't think when I was in my 20s, when we had children, I think um, I, I was only beginning to understand some of this. I was just beginning to enter the sort of stream of midlife struggles myself. So I'd like to go back and redo some things as a parent. Mm -hmm. But I certainly was able through the years to, to give them that message. Of that, I'm, I'm clear. In fact, my, my son, who said to me once uh, when I uh, when he left college in Florida and he drove all the way to New Mexico and started a life in a city in which he'd only spent a few hours but fell in love with the place. And I, I, I congratulated him for doing it. I said, it took courage. And he said, well, I've, uh, I've been allowed to live my life because I saw you living yours. And I thought, well, that helps a parent's guilt to some degree. Um, mm. But, uh, you know, I'm, I, I was grateful that he felt that support. And the same with my daughter, who got in her automobile. We lived in the East Coast of America, and she drove to Texas to start a oh. new life there, a professional life, and subsequently <laughs> a, a marital life. And uh, I, I think both of them would say, you know, we were freed up to to live our journey follow what made sense to us and and my own parents on the other hand bless their souls were um appalled that i left the middle part of the uh, united states i was born near chicago and uh they they found that dangerous and risky and and no support and and, and so forth but mm -hmm. I, I felt that, you know, part of my life was the journey, and I'm not confusing geography with a psychological journey, yes, sure. but to some degree, geography mm -hmm. was necessary in order to find those people and those experiences in life, which allowed me to um, find my own path through that. Um, we are approaching to our, uh, to the end of uh, this, uh, I would say, wonderful encounter. Thank you again, Jim, for your time. Uh, but I still have uh, one or maybe very short two questions. Uh, short uh, in terms of formulation, because their answer is not short at all, I'm sure. <laughs> you have here um, in a chapter uh, about the ghosts that run the, our lives, um, a sub chapters uh, about uh, the possession and lo losing our soul, of our soul. Um <clears throat> Do you think that we really can lose our soul even if, even to uh, some, uh, let's say, autonomous complexes? Well, people do all the time. Absolutely. Um, I use the word uh, uh, hauntings in English um, because we are possessed frequently by psychological formations. For example, those parental complexes, you know, to a child, the parent is God, so to speak. The parent is uh, this giant figure who is all powerful and all knowing. And whatever they're doing and however they treat us get internalized as statements about us, about the world out there and the traffic in between. And as a result of that, um, we carry those intrapsychic uh, messages, if you will. That's what, what is meant by the term complexes. You know, a complex is neither good nor bad. It's how it plays out in your life that makes the difference. We have complexes because we have history. So yes, people get possessed by complexes. The, the famous inferiority complex that Adler talked about is, is a classic one. All of us, to some degree, have senses of inferiority in some place. And, you know, we, you know, the time we were not able to solve the math problem or the time we lost the, the, the sports encounter with our, our team and whatever it may have been, it was awkward, embarrassing, defeating. We internalize those as potential statements about who we are as human beings. And uh, you know, you're not what happened to you. <laughs> you're what is wanting to enter the world through you. That's quite a different perspective. Mm. And that's why in some way we have to encounter these blockages within us or these 
places where there's an ex internal authority that contradicts the voice of the soul. Now, when I use that word soul again, I'm, I'm using it in a very generic sense of what is most deeply true in you and, and what is wanting its expression in the world through you, you see. That repositions the human ego into being a servant of something of transcendent value. You see, that has a deep spiritual dimension because it's, it's serving a story that's larger than simply the clusters of my history that I carry in the world with me. So I have used the term hauntings. We all live in haunted houses because we, we are carrying the, the voices of generations past and of cultures past. Who are you in this moment? Do you have permission to live your life? Um, what, what is your source of authority in your life? Um, what, what is your, you, you know, summons to a larger personhood in this life? Those are the kind of questions that may not have easy answers, but failing to address them in some more deliberate way over time means we're living the adaptive life. We're living the life of the adjustments that life asked of us in the past and not living as a full conscious human being. Uh, we need to uh, mind our uh, human condition, and you remind us uh, several times during the book uh, about uh, our mortality and our, uh, let's say, uh, human uh, nature. Um, our, my last question would be uh, related to finding uh, the archetypal resources within ourselves. Uh, what would you say to a um, a person that uh, is now starting its life, uh, their life, um, not necessarily from uh, the, let's say, uh, psychological uh, uh, studies background. Uh, so a young man or a young woman that uh, wants to uh, find these uh, archetypal resources within themselves, where shall they start? Well, I think, first of all, you have to ask yourself the question, what has always drawn your attention? What arouses your curiosity? What sparks that response inside of you? The world says to you, well, it's all about growing up, getting a job, you know, in this field or that field, getting married, starting a family, et cetera, et cetera. And you just fill your days until you're not here anymore. Well, there's certainly... <laughs> an existential reality to that. We're not ignoring that. On the other hand, <clears throat> what is that in service to inside of you? And is the price of that going to be a continuing violation of something within you that is precious? And, and, and again, which is uh, autonomous. It's not something we choose. Um, you know, I've spent my adult life as, as a teacher and as a therapist and as, as a writer. All of that has been addressing the suffering uh, that I have experienced around me and other people have experienced and, and seeking to address that in some way. So I think even as a child, that was an aspect of my personality. I was a child during World War II and I was perfectly safe in America's heartland compared to so many children in your part of the world. Um, but but I also knew from what I was exposed to, <clears throat> the world was full of conflict and suffering. And I remember going on street corners and just sort of reflecting about that, that I'm okay here, but there are people suffering elsewhere. So I think that I didn't choose to be compassionate. It was just part of my nature. And then, you know, initially I attached that to education because I found my teachers were those who were opening a new world to me. And I love that. And I spent a good part of my early life in public education. I was a college professor for a long time until life took over, gave me a depression at midlife. And then I began to ask different kinds of questions. That's what sent me to my first hour of psychotherapy at midlife. So I, I, I think that the inherent curiosities, the inherent um, uh, talents, the desire to to explore the world, to explore yourself, to explore a relationship, all of these things are, are to be honored, but they often get buried through the adaptations and the accumulations of responsibilities through the years, which are often important responsibilities. 
you know, how do you serve your family and the development of your own soul, for example? You know, that's not always an easy thing to work out. Mm -hmm. When I went into, uh, when I moved from academia into um, analytic psychology, there were times I had to be away from my family. I suffered that greatly. I know my family suffered that. They were supportive and wonderful in that uh, process. But it was it was not easy for any of us. And yet... It was part of what came out of that that depression, and I realized there was a lot of of unaddressed life that was uh, calling. And and looking at that is again not narcissistic; it's actually humbling. And and you'd have to say, well, here's something else from within me that I've neglected, and I have to begin to pay attention to that because if I don't, that's a bad uh, message to pass on to my children or. It's it's violating something profound in me that that is seeking expression. For those who have a religious background, it's sort of it's a violation of God's purpose for an individual. For those from a purely secular standpoint, it's it's like something in your soul will pathologize. That is to say, it will get sick, it will get ill if if you don't honor it over time. And so the human ego can get caught between these forces, the forces of obligation and and uh, and socialized roles, which have their values, uh, and and the summons of the soul, and that's what brings, as I said, people into therapy. And again, the word therapy comes from a Greek word that means to listen or attend to, to attend to, to be present to, to be a present to the expression of the soul. And when you do, that gives life a deeper purpose, a deeper resonance, and a deeper accountability. And I think that's what this book is about, is collective essays on the subject of these callings in our life to a, a deeper uh, responsibility to address the unfolding of our lives. Thank you very much. This is a very good point to finish. However, I still have a one very short question. Last one, I really, uh, I promise, because you said you so you put your entire life in service of discussing and healing the suffering, but isn't the suffering sometimes the cost for our, uh, you know, development? Absolutely, certainly, certainly. Um, actually, I have a, a chapter in a book that's coming out next year uh, on happiness. And people think of happiness, if I owned that house or if I were in that relationship, I'd be happy and so forth. And it's one of the great delusions of our times that happiness is something to be discovered out there. If you go to the right street in Bucharest, you'll, you'll find happiness waiting there for you. You see, well, it doesn't quite work out that way. Happiness is a byproduct of being in right relationship to your own soul at this time. Uh, my, I, as I said before, I don't enjoy being present to the suffering of others, but it makes me happy to have something that gives me this deep sense of purpose and uh, a capacity to share that process with somebody and to be honored in being invited into their lives. So I'm 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 flooded with happiness at my work, though my work does not make me happy. If you can appreciate the distinction there, so uh, again, as as we began, life's a short pause between two great mysteries. How are you going to spend that pause? And maybe even more importantly, in service to what values? Be sure that those values are really the ones that are wishing expression through you, rather than simply have been imposed upon you by your time and place and, and culture. Thank you so very much. I uh, want to show again uh, the book that we were discussing about. It's um, uh, a very rich book and I invite every one of you to read it, to meditate over it, to sink in it. Căutarea sensului, chemarea sinelui și redefinirea centrului interior. Jim Hollis, thank you very much for your time and for your kind and, you know, like uh, endless generosity. Uh, at least I can assure everyone this uh, from my experience uh, of talking to you until now. Thank you so very much for your time. Well, thank you in return. And it's been a privilege to spend this time with you. <laughs>